So welcome to Unleashed Learning TV and Unleashed Learning Radio for our podcast listeners. Now to mark the upcoming one year anniversary of COVID related lockdowns, we are honored to welcome the ABC's Dr. Norman Swan to our Unleashed Learning TV studio. Now you might know Dr. Swan from his expert insights on ABC Radio's health report throughout this COVID period, his Corona cast, which is his podcast, and his frequent appearances on ABC News and specialist feature programs. And he's here exclusively on Unleashed Learning TV to answer your questions as we navigate COVID and move into hopefully a post-COVID teaching world. So Norm, welcome to the studio. My pleasure. Thank you for being here. I've told you a few times, but um, educators we work with, you're the name for the last 12 months that constantly comes up. And they say to us, so the anniversary of COVID lockdown is coming up and your name constantly has come up for 12 months about who people have turned to for information, uh, trust, and to break the noise of what's going on. So that's why I want to interview for the, for the lockdown uh, anniversary. My pleasure. And it's not just lockdown anniversary, it's the anniversary, as we speak, mm. it's almost the anniversary of declaring it a pandemic. Mm. I remember seeing you one day, I was about to fly to Melbourne, and you said, uh, you're not going to Melbourne. It was a year ago. And two days later, the state was closed mm. down, and that did not happen. So no. here we are. So what we did is we asked educators from all over the place to send in their questions that they had for you. And we have some of the top questions we've got. I think we've got a great range of questions. So we'll start with Jacqueline in California. Sure. Okay. So Jacqueline's question is, she's a school leader. This is going on in California because they're still in lockdown. And the CDC guidelines uh, recommends that they safely reopen schools as, as quickly as possible. But people are nervous because of vaccine. So what they're wondering about is, is it possible to open the school b- back up even if there's guidelines being followed, if everyone hasn't gotten the vaccine, especially when young people don't probably keep the mask on or keep distant or so, um, can they really open up schools without a full vaccine? So this is a really difficult question. Mm. So let's start with the age of kids. Mm. So kids under 12 um, are probably infected less often. Mm. So they're less liable to be infected. And if they get infected, they're less liable to get severe disease. So we're talking about sort of protecting kids. Mm-hmm. People are less worried um, about junior school, elementary school mm-hmm. kids, to use the American phrase. Um, and but in ter- so teachers is another matter mm-hmm. because kids can infect teachers. Mm-hmm. So I don't know exactly what the guidelines are, but I would have thought that the first thing that really got to happen mm-hmm. is that the teachers have got to be immunized. So if teachers are all vaccinated with a high performance vaccine like Pfizer. So that's what's tends to go around. Mm. Johnson and Johnson is the other vaccine that's being used in the United States and it's pretty good as well. It's protecting against severe disease. Mm. So the teachers are all immunized, then they're protected against serious disease. And um, that's probably the best guarantee. It's gonna be a while, maybe six months before Mm. kids under 18 are immunized because they don't have the evidence yet to recommend that. There are trials going on. it's, it's really hard to make sure that all your kids are vaccinated mm-hmm. because that's just not going to happen unless you're in a senior school with a lot of older kids and they're getting the vaccine. And the other, so then you've just got to think through um, how many people have been vaccinated, what proportion mm-hmm. in your community, and do you start restricting again parents coming into mm-hmm. the playground and the school grounds it, you know, it's very hard to find out whether they've been immunized or not, but maybe until more people have been immunized, you actually let them drop kids off at the school so parents aren't mixing with other kids. The, the problem with schools is, and why schools are included in lockdowns, is not so much the worry about uh, children, young students, it's more the circulation of traffic. Mm. Just think about it. If your kids are at school, then parents are dropping them off in the car, and you've got millions of people circulating. Mm. And so part of the closure of schools is to keep from people from circulating. So all these are very tough. And then in this classroom itself, it's got to be really well ventilated so that you've got a big circulation of air. And particularly there's things like choir practice. It's very hard with kids, but you know, as much as possible, particularly in California where it's warmer, mm-hmm. where you can get outside, classes outside, minimize how much you're in stuffy classrooms. If some of your classrooms are stuffy, you gotta look at why they're stuffy, maybe putting in fans with open windows, just make sure air is circulating. It's dead air, people talking loudly, singing, 
that sort of thing mm -hmm. that circulates the virus. Okay, um, so we had a parent uh, of a primary school student here in New South Wales, Amy, and she said, how do we help children manage the unknown during this time? Because there's so much information going on. And she said, especially when it comes to helping them have confidence in the system. So when will we get the vaccine? Do I need to do it every year? We don't want our kids becoming obsessive compulsive right now, like germaphobes, but we also want to give them good information. So what's our recommendation to helping our students, our children navigate this time right now? Um, you've got to know what the child's thinking mm. um, and talk to them about it without reinforcing any anxieties. So w I've been through this in the last 12 months because um, in the early days of the pandemic, I suddenly realized the distress that some children were going through. Mm. We decided at a whim that we were going to take talk back from children. And I was taking these Collins and a little boy uh, called Huck phoned in. He was, he said, I'm Huck and I'm nine years old and I want to know, is my family going to die? Mm. Mm. And at that moment, my life stopped. I just had to stop. Now I trained in pediatrics before I went into broadcasting. So the kid is everything. So, the, you know, I was on air, thousands of people are listening, but this child wow. across the distance became my total focus. And, and how I approach that is to, to actually talk to them, say, well, tell me about your family. So I've got my sister and my mum and dad, and I've got grandma and grandpa. And I, and I was able to say, look, and you talk to them in simple language, but none of the, your teachers know how to talk to kids. Mm -hmm. I don't have to tell you. You know, yeah. you know a million times more than me about how to do this, but not patronize them. And I just said, look, um, I can say with confidence that your mum and dad are not going to die. Even if they get infected, they're not going to die because your mum and dad are young and your sister's going to be fine. They're not going to die mm -hmm. either. And, and your grandma and grandpa, you just got to be careful with them that you don't infect them. And from time to time, I still hear of kids who are quite distressed. Um, so you've got to find out what their worries are because the worries may not just be the vaccine. It may be that they're frightened of another lockdown or the unknown or... They've heard, they've been into the internet and heard of dreadful side effects. So you've just got to know what it is that's bothering them rather than a cookie cutter approach where you just give them one size fits all and know what they want to know. Um, and, the, and the reality about the vaccine is that the vaccines are safe. Mm. You might get a little bit sick for a day with a sore arm and so on after them, but they're basically safe. Not 300 million, as we speak, about 300 million doses have been administered around the world. And apart from allergies in, some, in a small number of people in about four per million doses, um, there's, there are no significant side effects. So this is amazing. And yes, we will almost certainly need boosters. Oh. And we might need a booster this year, not because the, the vaccine wears off, but because of these variants that people have heard about. So for example, we just had Jacqueline asking a question oh. from California. Oh. There's a Californian variant. They don't know very much about it yet, but it's likely to be a little bit vaccine resistant. There's a Brazilian variant, which turns out, again, as we speak today, there's research out in the New England Journal of Medicine showing that the Pfizer vaccine is effective against the Brazilian variant. Uh, then there's a South African variant where the vaccine effectiveness is a little bit less. So it's likely that what's going to need to be happening is a, a booster dose that covers maybe the South African variant and maybe the Californian one or others that have emerged during this time. So it's not just going to be two jabs now or one jab if you get the Johnson one. There'll be another one in a few months' time. And we just don't know what's going to happen you know, in the future. Fantastic. Okay, Norman, this is the question I've wanted to ask you for a year because I listened to your uh, health report. And one of the things that I noticed, and I'm just guessing here, is that you don't share everything you know. You're very specific and strategic about what you're sharing. So what we talk about at Unleashed Learning is to cut back if you want to make learning stick. Yep. So I want to know during this time of COVID how either you or your team, when you're on the news or you're on a podcast, the coronavirus podcast, or on the health report, how do you decide what to share with the public so you're not sharing all the information but you're targeting what you really want to get across? Well, it's knowing the audience. Mm. So if I'm talking to teachers, it's obviously different from oh. talking to children um, and or talking to other health professionals. Um, 
it, it's not an easy one because people want to know the evidence behind what you're saying. Well, I think they do. So I could spout forth. Well, how do you know I'm just not some mad guru um, spouting forth with no evidence? So you've got to understand what the question is, what people want to know, and give just enough of the background evidence mm -hmm. that you're confident that I'm talking from a point of view of science. There's something backing me up. So if you take my, that last question, I was clear to talk about that you know, as of today, there's new New England Journal of mm -hmm. Medicine research showing that the vaccine works against the Brazilian variant. I'm not saying that, I'm quoting research. Mm. But I don't have to go into the fact that it was laboratory research, they generated recombinant virus, blah, blah, blah. People don't need to know that. They just need to know that reputable scientists in a reputable journal have done that. So you trim it away, but you don't trim it so much that you're giving glib answers and people wonder, can I trust it or mm. can I believe it? So the key word in all this, and it works in schools as well for kids, is trust. Do I trust the teacher in terms of what I'm getting? Um, are you telling me the truth? Are you hiding stuff? And you've got to be transparent and trustworthy. And what comes and how you earn that trust is by being right. If you're wrong, admitting it oh. and, and correcting it very quickly, which is one of the things I, I do on the podcast and in, on air and giving enough of the background so that you can trust that where it's coming from is reliable. Well, it's one of the keys in the system, which you not from the system, but the educator matters. And one of the things that people have said about you over the year is, this is the person we trust. That keeps coming up what I've heard. So who we are matters, and, and, and that trust factor for you, and thinking about who the audience is, determines what you're sharing and how you're sharing it. And if you mess up, you, you acknowledge you've messed up. Yeah, and it's also how you, um, how you communicate in, in terms of your demeanor. Mm. Um, so I don't know what, how much teachers get taught about, about that sort of thing, but um, we were talking before we started about broadcast journalism. And one of the things that journalists have got to learn is that it's actually much easier to be a newspaper journalist, not that there are very many newspapers <laughs> anymore, or an online journalist, than it is to be on television, mm. to be filmed. Because when you're on television, you're actually performing. Mm. And how you look and how you sit and uh, determines whether people trust you or rely on you. Um, and uh, you know, my son learned that during the, he, my son, Jonathan Swan, works for Axios in the United States, interviewed President Trump last year. We all watched and it. His, <laughs> uh, you know, and there were memes about his yeah. facial expressions. And you know, and he's he's relative. You know, he, he's he's been in journalism a while now, but not twenty years. Mm -hmm. And he was a print journalist, and he had to learn about what, how you sit and how you react and and what because it makes a difference. So um, when you're talking to somebody, it's mm -hmm. having a calm demeanor. It's about not expressing too much emotion. It's about thinking hard, and it's about looking people in the eye. Mm. It's, and if it's a camera, you look the camera straight down the lens, and you, um, and you calmly, dispassionately you know, talk about things, even if you feel really strongly. So I used to feel really, well, I feel very strongly about lockdowns. It's the only thing that works. And you know, it, it's a tragedy that in the United States, oh. southern states are starting to lift lockdowns, yeah because it is the only thing that works and it's too early and you're gonna see Spikes. a third or fourth wave in the United States and it's a terrible thing because it's preventable. Um, and so, but I feel strongly about that, but um, if I were to actually display the emotion that I feel inside about that, people would lose trust in me because they think I was just becoming an advocate rather than just telling people what the evidence is. So why we say who the teacher is matters, how we show up, um, how we dress, what the classroom looks like, all the ways we communicate. It's yeah. not just the things we're saying, but what you're saying is how you say it and the way you show up and the eye contact. Right. I, think I'll, I think a lot about how I dress. Mm. Um, so your know, background information here for this, your know, backstory. Yeah. Yeah. I come upstairs to do this interview. <laughs> I thought it was an audio interview. <laughs> I'm wearing an old shirt and the floppies and uh, oh, I'm yeah. gonna go down, you yeah. know, and I have a shower mm. and, and think this through in terms of a jacket I know that looks good on television, colors and so on, because it makes a difference. 
and I'll decide sometimes when it's important to wear a crisp white shirt with a tie, sometimes where it's appropriate to be informal. And I think that through. Mm. We teach this in the system because who we are matters, how we show up matters, and everything speaks, so it sends a message about who we are and what we're doing. So we're in perfect alignment, and that's why we're glad you're here. So this is a really great question. We had Burns, an Australian uh, early childhood leader, and they run a lot of professional development. And what's happening now in the sector is that the early childhood educators are have some anxiety about showing up for face-to-face -face professional development. And so even if it's COVID safe and the vaccine's going on, is there anything that professionals need to know, the EC professionals, to feel safe about returning to face-to-face -face professional development? The one thing that can give people even, it depends whether we're doing it in Australia or the United yeah, States yeah. or Europe. <clears throat> and I know people are watching this from all over. If you're doing it in Australia, there's no virus around. We're lucky. And so you can feel safe. But if you want to feel safer, wear a mask. Mm. Um, because a mask, if you've got an infection, even if it's influenza or a cold, you will stop, you will radically reduce the chance of transmitting it to others. So people can wear masks. They can still be a bit socially distanced. Distance. They can still do hand hygiene and things like that. Although, whilst it's important to have hand hygiene because it does stop respiratory viruses, um, it's less important than just the airborne spread. Being in a well-ventilated room, not stuffy. You, you, you go to learn, walk into a room that feels stuffy, danger, danger, mm. danger, either change room or open windows, even if, if it's a cold day, and make sure there's air circulating. And um, those sorts of things can help you you'll feel safer. The, the virus tends to circulate in dead air uh, with people talking loudly, too closely crammed together, um, try and do it in more open circumstances where it's feeling fresh. And if you, I think masks are the best way to feel secure. Fantastic, so it means that people that are showing up, even if it's COVID safe and knowing in Australia specifically, we don't really have the virus going around, that if they're uncomfortable, they should wear a mask because that's gonna keep them Absolutely. safe. Absolutely, 100%. Okay, is there anything else you think educators should know that you haven't, for all the stuff you shared, in 12 months, and like I said, they, they've, your name's been mentioned a lot, that you think we should be talking about or thinking about as we move into a post, hopefully post-COVID period? I, I think that we, th we need to um, think beyond ourselves and our own envi environment. So I, I just think it's important to understand that this virus has exposed inequity in the community. So those people watching us who work in disadvantaged schools those are the kids, you know, if in Australia were to come back, those are the kids who are going to get it first in their families. In the United States, you know, Hispanic communities mm -hmm. and black communities right. are disproportionately experiencing this. And we need to work hard to make sure that they disproportionately get added attention when it comes to immunization, to vaccination, so that they're covered. Um, we do need to think as communities mm -hmm. rather than individuals. And I think that one of the things that's hampered the United States is that um, there's this feeling of individualism. Um, that's what it has, that is, in fact, what has made America great. I hate to say making America great <laughs> as the current environment, but yeah. that has was you know, that you can go and you can have an idea and you can make it, you, you can make it and you can create a huge business or a great school yeah. and individual work. But the reality is that that doesn't work in a pandemic. Mm -hmm. You've got to work as a community. It's communities that defeat pandemics. And schools are at the heart of communities. Mm -hmm. They are one of the pivots. You know, churches, synagogues, mosques, schools, schools are all pivots in the community. We, we, we've lost a lot of the community anchors. And I think schools need to see themselves, even if they're not actively doing anything as part of community cohesion. And if you're bringing the school community together and that larger community that surrounds the school together, that actually will help to control the pandemic and future pandemics, because the next pandemic will be just, it may just be around the corner. It could be next year, it could be any time. So I think those are big things. And because teachers think a lot about communities. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that uh, how well a child does in school is, is, is associated with how connected they feel to their school community. Does the school care? 
That doesn't mean the school doesn't have discipline. That it's like parenting. It's firm but loving. Mm. You're setting boundaries and so on. I'm, look, I'm talking to people that know three thousand times more than I do about this. <laughs> but it's that notion more broadly. So I think schools have got a lot to offer mm. in terms of that community cohesion, and a lot have done that. And so I think those those are the things. And demythologizing when you you know, understanding what is fake news, yeah. what is false information. Uh, being able to quietly and calmly correct that, not getting too excited about it, and um, and not um, be prejudicial against people who are vaccine hesitant. Mm. Uh, you know, anti-vaccination people are really in the minority, both in the United States, New Zealand, Australia, other countries. There's a tiny minority, the media overstates that. But people are genuinely vaccine hesitant in some places, and it's because they've got good reasons for it, you know, they're, they're not silly reasons. They, you know, they say, has this been rushed? And have you cut corners? Therefore, we don't know that it's safe. Well, yes, it's been rushed, but in fact, the only reason they've been able to rush through the trials is that tragically so many people have had this yeah. infection, they've been able to do very large trials very quickly. Um, so there are answers to all these questions. Um, and we should respect people for their hesitancy and deal with it straight on. And kids might be hesitant too. It's also, it just makes me think of my mom used to say, are we practicing meism or weism? And you just said the viruses uh, can be solved with more of we rather than me. And that's part of the pandemic of what we're experiencing right now. Communities defeat pandemics, mm -hmm. not governments. Wow. So this is um, uh, so as part of my occupational therapy uh, <laughs> during the COVID-19. Um, I've been writing a book, even though I've been busy, um, I actually found time. The reason I found time is not flying anywhere. So mm. not in airports or travel. Anyway, so I've written this book. It's called So You Think You Know What's Good For You. Um, it's aimed at millennials, but anybody who doesn't feel like a millennial will find it useful too. So it's, it's, it's all about stopping worrying about things you don't need to worry about. You know, people are worried about low carb, high carb um, supplements. Um, they're worried about sex. They're worried about mental health and so on. There are things you should worry about but there are far fewer things you should worry about than there. So it's about you know, defanging your anxiety about health and you know, just getting down to basics. Well, mine has that shot, so I was hoping you were gonna say there's a patch, but I'll, yeah. I'll do the shot. I'll try okay. and tell the truth. Okay, <laughs> thanks, Norm. We'll post about the book and we'll hopefully get to share it when it comes out. Good. Well, we'll end on that note. Um, what we do is we always ask a question at the end, and I mean, I just repeat it. Everywhere I've gone, your name's come up. And so um, we wanted to have you to kind of mark the anniversary of COVID. So we've got a question for the audience. And if you'll stick around for just one second, our question for you is, what is your takeaway from what Dr. Swan just said in this episode? So we'd love to hear some of the best conversations take place after the episode and um, join the conversation there. So uh, Norm, thank you for your time. I know it's been a busy day for you. Thank you for coming to our office. And thank you for the work you folks do for the world. It's been a crazy 12 months and we continue to serve and do the best we can during this time. So thank you and thank you. If you're an educator at a school, business or organization, knowing how to make learning stick for everyone might be the most important thing you know how to do. Make learning stick for everyone. My new book is here. To find out more, go to unleash-learning.com.